Mr. Bush, if you could just begin by highlighting the Army's role in supporting the effort in Ukraine generally, how has the Army contributed and what has the Army accomplished so far in terms of getting equipment, weapons, parts, munition to Ukraine? How much has come, from, come straight from U.S. stockpile so far? So, you know, in dollar value terms, um, that comes from the authority provided by Congress called presidential drawdown. That's taking our equipment we have in stock and providing it to Ukraine uh, with a funding payback uh, uh, comes later. Um, approximately $13 billion worth um, has been provided. That's across many, many things. That's everything from uh, bullets all the way up to, you know, uh, you know, uh, striker vehicles, Bradley vehicles, a lot of munitions. Um, so it's a wide range of things. Um, that effort, uh, though, has come with, uh, thanks to Congress as well, a very uh, flexible way for us to replenish those things and uh, funding that we have been using uh, aggressively to get the replacement items on contract quickly. So the Pentagon has committed the Army. Um, you'll supply over 1,600 Stinger missiles, over 8,500 Javelin systems, a million uh, 155 millimeter rounds, Gimblers, the list goes on. Uh, how much longer can the Army pull from ammunition stockpiles? You know, has it reached its threshold where it can't give up any more to Ukraine and now must build more? Can you talk about that tipping point? So first of all, a lot of the numbers, including all those, are in the public space are not accurate. Um, some of them are frankly higher than reality, but but they're still significant numbers. Um, so a judgment on readiness, meaning um, the uh, readiness question in terms of like, uh, you know, can we, what's the risk with sending something versus retaining it in stock? So I don't do that in army acquisition. Those judgments are being made, you know, by the secretary of the army, chief staff of the army, secretary of defense, chairman of the joint chiefs. Um, and they, uh, I just know that watching the system, uh, they are very carefully monitoring that question every time one of the drawdowns is reviewed. And uh, they um, are in a position to make those judgments based on all the facts and all the things that come into play. So from an acquisition perspective, um, I just know that we are uh, moving out rapidly, far faster than normal to replenish. Um, that will help mitigate risk over time um, to uh, stockpiles. but. But stockpiles overall, I can just assure you, uh, based on what uh, Secretary of Defense has said, the United States is still fully ready for anything that could happen. The Army has also committed some major weapon systems like Patriot and Abrams tanks. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions on this. To, to start, the Army is committing one Patriot battery. Uh, that's tough for the service considering the op-tempo for the Patriot force. That's the highest in the Army. How are you managing to commit a system considering how this capability is stretched thin around the globe? And how are preparations going to transfer this? Um, you know, this isn't a system that can be learned how to use overnight. So when do you anticipate it arriving in Ukraine? So I can't give a detailed date, but uh, training is already well underway. And uh, we have found a way using um, some of our uh, systems that weren't in operational units to do this. We're going to do this in a way that doesn't directly affect any operational unit readiness. As far as uh, timelines, yeah, training is underway. Um, Ukrainians have been very very effective at learning complicated things very quickly. Um, that's happening here. So um, I anticipate uh, our systems being in action over there uh, very soon. And for Abrams, the secretary has indicated that it won't take a year and a half to two years to get it to Ukraine, but it also won't take just months either. Uh, so what is the most practical time estimate you've seen to get those to Ukraine? And why will it take that length of time? Many readers have been asking, you know, how come it takes so long to get tanks sent to Ukraine? Can you talk about what's involved there? Well, first thing to remember is that it's not just sending a tank. So a tank by itself is not a military capability. Um, you have to send the whole package. So that includes ammunition, vehicles to maintain it, fuel, and you have to do the training on the system so that it can be sustained in combat. So um, the first thing to remember is it's it's far more complicated than just sending um, a particular uh, combat vehicle. Um, the second factor is uh, we have to be you know we have to prepare equipment to go in a way uh, that doesn't impact readiness of U.S. Army units, and it doesn't affect deliveries of equipment to other allies who are also uh, we are working to fulfill their orders for M1 tanks. So there's Numerous factors that, that uh, get into this. Um, multiple options are being considered. Um, and uh, 
the Secretary of Defense, they're just not yet ready to announce an exact timeline. And uh, we may not exact announce an exact timeline because, again, uh, we don't want to give the Russians certainty about when something's going to arrive. But efforts sure. are underway to do it as quickly as possible. General Conville, for the better part of a year, has been saying we won't be replacing stuff going to Ukraine with new old stuff. Uh, can you talk about what that looks like for certain systems go, you know, that are going over, like Stinger comes to mind, but there are other efforts underway to ramp up delivery of other modern uh, versions of things, such as re maybe replacing uh, M113s with AMPV. So what else might be a foot? Can you talk a little bit about that? I can, and that's a key flexibility that Congress has uh, given us here that is uh, very advantageous. Uh, so you mentioned 113s. Uh, those, of course, aren't in production anymore, and we don't want them anymore. Um, so we are replacing those with AMPV, which is currently in low-rate production and hopefully about to go into full-rate production. Um, we're doing it in other areas. So some of our older radars that have been provided, we are going to replace with the very latest, newest um, Army ground-based radars. Uh, we're doing it with munitions going over. So if we send an older version of, say, a tow missile, um, a Patriot, or something, uh, even a Javelin, we are able to replace it with just the latest thing in production that's the best thing for the U.S. Army. Um, so that's really important that Congress allowed us to do that, and uh, we are taking maximum advantage of it. One limitation on it is it has to be something that's you know in production. So we can't do research and development. We have to replace it with something in production uh, that's ready to go. So, for example, we send night vision devices. Uh, we can also replace with other night vision devices currently in active production like ENVGB. So I think there's that's really overall really uh, a good news story that we're allowed to replace with the very latest thing we can. Now, I know, you know, you're talking about replacing things with the very latest that's, you know, ready to go in production. Um, is this accelerating any modernization efforts? You know, for instance, there is a plan, you know, the Army has a plan to uh, replace Stinger ultimately with something new. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, any plans to ramp up any particular programs because of what we are using in Ukraine? In addition to so that. it's certain, 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 sure. So uh, Ukraine dynamics certainly affects conversations about timelines um, for starting new programs. Um, in the case of Stinger, we found some ways to buy time uh, in the near term, including, for example, refurbishing older Stinger missiles. Um, we'll think we'll get at least 1,200 good new Stingers out of that effort um, and save a lot of money doing it. That buys us time to make sure the Stinger stocks are healthy enough to give us time to get the new program underway. So um, we do have a path to a Stinger replacement program. Um, we're gonna work with Congress in FY24 about potential options for starting it um, in that year. But okay. it's a clear requirement and uh, the Army is going to move out on that. A lot of attention recently has been on 155 millimeter artillery. Um, the Army has been doing quite a bit to ramp up production. If you can highlight those efforts, that would be great. And additionally, elaborate on the on the timeline for ramping things up. Um, you know, how many munitions are you hoping to build in a certain time frame? Uh, it'd be great to get a little bit more clarity on those goals. Sure. So, uh, thanks to generous con uh, congressional funding for uh, we got everything we asked for for um, funding the capacity increase. So, what is the capacity increase in the case of 155? in large parts means additional machinery, additional production lines that we're gonna staff. Um, we're gonna add entirely new uh, machine tools, for example, to several existing facilities. Um, so that's going on right now. So that's um, you know close to a uh, billion dollars just for 155 ramp up and that's on contract and underway. As far as the timeline, um, you know, we've set pretty aggressive goals, but I already see us um, starting to overperform on those goals. So you know, just last month, we got up to 20,000 um, metal parts produced. That's the shell body itself. And we're going to uh, match that with continued increases over this year. So uh, we're already on our ramp to um, approximately, the secretary uh, said in a recent event, um, around 70,000 a month in uh, early part of FY25. And we are already on a, a steady drumbeat path to get there. Um, it does take time. So getting the machine tools, getting them working, and getting them verified to produce at the quality levels we expect, which are very high, um, because this is, you know, these are munitions not just for Ukraine. These are things that our soldiers will potentially use. So we have very high standards, but we're going to, we're not going to compromise on those standards, and we are going to go faster than, I think, the current projections, which 
are on purpose a bit conservative, uh, we're doing everything we can to overperform and do that ramp up faster.